I'm very excited again, like I said, to introduce Toby Falaren in his new novel, A Particular Kind of Black Man. Uh, He is, of course, an award-winning DC-based Nigerian-American writer. He won the uh, Kane Prize for African Writing in in 2013 and was shortlisted in 2016. He was recently named to Africa 39 list of most promising African writers under 40. He was educated at Morehouse College and the University of Oxford, where he earned two master's degrees as a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, his first novel, his debut, is a powerful coming-of-age story of Tunde Akinola, son of a Nigerian-born parent struggling to make a new life in a small town in Utah. When the family eventually breaks under the, the strain, his life uh, becomes a search for a place where he can feel at home. Following his protagonist from his uh, remarried father's household to a Texas middle school and on to a historically black college, Falaren explores questions of identity and exile, manhood, and meaning itself. His novel's already garnering praise with none other than author Marlon James writing from the breathless first sentence to the devastating last. This is a particularly mesmerizing kind of novel. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Tope Falaren to Politics and Prose. I have been waiting for this day for such a long time. It's, a, <laughs> it's incredible to be here. Um, I woke up this morning and I was so excited about, you know, reading this morning and I, as I often do, I picked up my phone and I began to scroll and I saw that Toni Morrison had passed away and instantly my entire day was kind of ruined. Um, I couldn't help but spend much of the day thinking about the impact that she had on me as a sort of thinker and writer and I couldn't help but um, sort of remember, picture a very nerdy 16 year old boy, um, okay, maybe not so nerdy, maybe super nerdy. Um, And he's uh, spending a lot of time in the school library. And he walks into the library, and the librarian hands him a book and says, this book could very well change the course of your life. And he rolls his eyes because he just read a great Star Trek novel the week before that he thought was pretty spectacular. Um, And he takes the book home, and he reads it. And it does, in fact, begin to change him in very important ways. Uh, That book was The Bluest Eye. Um, And the reason why it was so impactful and important for me was because, for a couple reasons. One, I saw not necessarily my experience reflected in that book, but I saw an experience that resonated with me and that in many ways um, was similar to experiences of friends that I had spoken with, uh, people that I knew quite well. And secondly, uh, I was so deeply impressed by her literary courage, even back then, because I was accustomed to reading books in which people who looked like me weren't centered in the books. They weren't an important part of what was going on in those novels. And to read that book and to see people who um, were reckoning with the same kind of questions that I I was um, and had the same kind of guilt about being different within this country. I had profound guilt when I was growing up about about being a black person. I could never figure out why. Um, And so to see, to read a book in which that was kind of dealt with head on uh, had a tremendous impact on me. And uh, I owe that librarian a a debt of gratitude. I had the great fortune of seeing a film called The Pieces I Am about two weeks ago that's actually playing in Bethesda right now. I recommend that everyone here see it if they can. It's about the life of Toni Morrison. And I learned, I, I you know, pride myself as somebody who spends a lot of time trying to learn about my heroes, and she certainly uh, applies. And, and, but I learned a great deal more in that film. One of the things I learned um, was that she kind of, in addition to giving up her entire life to become a better writer, um, that there were, because my assumption, you know, kind of thinking about Toni Morrison is that she releases her first book. Everybody says it's the most amazing book that's ever been written, and she kind of flies on to literary glory. Uh, contrary to that opinion, though, um, in actuality, people, I, when her first book came out, people celebrated her prose, her ability to write, but they also talked about the fact that she was limiting herself by writing about the black experience. And, um, and she kind of forged ahead despite that criticism. And in so doing, I think, creates this entire new canon of work that people will read forever. Um, I thought a lot about that, and I thought about my own history in this city. My then-girlfriend and now wife, Stephanie, and I came here back in 2008. Um, and I didn't know that I was moving sort of next door to a bookstore. And, uh, and I'm a bookish fellow, and so I was walking around one day, and I saw politics and prose, and I was just elated. And I thought, wow, there's this incredible sort of resource that's a couple blocks down from me. And so I began to come here. And around the time I came, I began to come here in 2008, the financial crisis hit. Um, and so this place was, you know, because I suffered immensely during that period. I came, I just left a job from Google. I got a bonus from Google. I assumed that I would, you know, be one of the wealthiest people of all time. 
the crisis hits, uh, and then you know money runs low. But I still had this sense that I I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be an artist, and I would do whatever it took to achieve that dream. And so I began to come here on a consistent basis during those dark days when I wasn't working very much. And um, I remember the poetry section used to be right back there. And I used to come in because at that point in my life, I was obsessed with poetry and I was reading it and writing it. And I used to come into this store and I would just kind of look around, make sure that nobody thought, I, you know, like the booksellers wouldn't kick me out because I was here so often. And I would go back into the poetry section and I would uh, read the poems. And I was afraid about doing this because my assumption was that I was supposed to purchase the books and not just kind of read them. And I just continued to read and nobody said a word to me. And so I gained more courage. The other thing that I did a lot when I moved here was that I spent a lot of time in museums. And one of the things that I noticed was that um, a lot of people would sit, because I went to the museum during the day, when very serious aspiring artists go to the museum. And they would sit and they would have a pad and they would sort of try to copy whatever masterworks were on the wall. And I was inspired by that. And I thought, you know, I want to be a great writer. And so what if I take my own notebook into politics and prose and I copy down some of the poems that are inspiring me? And I thought, well, that's probably problematic. You know, again, I'm supposed to be buying these books, but <laughs> we'll give it a shot. Um, and so I began to do that. I had a notebook and I carried my notebook with me and I'd sit in that corner in a very comfortable chair and I'd kind of surreptitiously pull a book from the shelf and I'd read it and then I'd copy some poems into the book and I'd look around and it was completely acceptable. And so I did that for quite a, a while. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to get a job at a place called the Institute for Policy Studies, but I wasn't getting a great, great salary. Uh, and politics and prose was still a kind of lodestar for me. So I'd come here and I graduated to the remainder section. And so now I could, you know, afford to buy books for like six bucks, hardbacks. I was so happy. I was in heaven. And so I began to build my library that way. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to get a job at the PCAOB. And, um, and I was able to graduate to getting hardcovers. And now I could sort of participate. And I was so, I remember being excited about the fact that I could participate in a literary culture in which uh, I, I was so happy with and I wanted to be a part of. So, um, and I used to walk by all the time, see the window, and kind of imagine one of my books being featured. And so I am literally living within a dream. And I thank you so much for coming out for this reading today. Um, there are so many people I could thank for this experience. And um, I, I want to you know, get to the reading at some point. But I do want to shout out a couple of folks. Steve Harris, um, my boss for many years at the PCOB. He, um, the thing that was so important about Steve was during our first meeting, I kind of went in and I was kind of in the midst of my sort of obsession with poetry and art. And I decided that whenever I went to a job interview, I'd be very honest about the person I was and I would not try to sort of, you know, keep some part of myself hidden. And so I walked into his office and I said, um, you know, yes, I'm very interested in policy work and I, and I want to do a good job for you, but I also want to be a writer. And um, he, had a, a, he had a painting on his wall. I think it was a Calder. It was a celebration of Calder's work. And we being, began to talk about the, the Calder and uh, the de Kooning that he also had in his office. And um, the one thing he said to me is that when you're here, you can be fully yourself. And so um, it was one of the first times in my professional life that somebody accepted me fully. And I deeply appreciate that. So thank you very much. Um, Nina Majerizad is also here. I spent a lot of time away from the office and she had to cover for me and she never complained not once about that. So very, very grateful. Uh, Ethel Burt Miller, who's an institution in the city. Um, I started writing my novel back in 2010 when I was at the Institute for Policy Studies. And um, Ethel Burt uh, was, I knew that he was a very important writer and I was very nervous about approaching him initially. And I asked him any number of questions and I sent him my initial work and he sent it back marked up and, you know, and was kind of cruel with me. But, you know, I guess he wanted me to get here, so I appreciate that cruelty back then. But no, he's been a wonderful mentor, a, a very good friend. Um, he often sends me text messages about, you know, the things I'm supposed to be doing. Or um, He sent me a text message. I have this habit of staying up late to, to uh, read and write. And he sent me a text message like a month ago and says, you know, you need to start getting up early. You know, got to take care of that baby. And I was like, what are you, but I was like, okay, you know, that's probably some truth to that. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, my brother is also here. He's one of the most important members of my life, and we've been through so much together. So uh, it means the world to me that he's here as well. Um, I see so many people. I don't want to leave anyone out. All of you guys are incredibly important to me. Um, 
Uh, but I cannot begin my reading without mentioning my wife, who has been there for me from the very start. I met Stephanie when I was 19 years old at Bates College. Um, and yeah, she she was my first love. And I was kind of reckoning with what that meant to me because I went to college very kind of committed to doing well academically. And she's the one person who kind of uh, kind of opened the possibility that there was more to life than just kind of being a an academic powerhouse, which is what I was obsessed with at the time. So we've been through so much together and uh, she has been a stalwart, a steady force in my life and I'm deeply grateful for that. Um, so I thought I would begin today I'll give some more shout outs as the night progresses. Yeah, very, very happy to be here. But I thought I'd begin by reading a bit from my novel. Uh, and then I would love to hear any questions or concerns you may have, and the night can proceed accordingly. So I'll read from the first chapter of my book. I'll read for about maybe five or six minutes, and then the night can begin. Um, she told me I could serve her in heaven. She accompanied me to school each day. School was about a mile away and a few hundred feet into my truck, just as my family's apartment building drifted out of view behind me, she would appear at my side. I don't remember how she looked. Memory often summons a generic figure in her place, an elderly white woman with frizzled gray hair, slightly bent over, a smile featuring an assortment of gaps and silver linings. I do remember her touch, however. It felt cool and papery, disarmingly comfortable on the hottest days of fall. She would often pat my head as we walked together, and a penetrating silence would cancel the morning sounds around us. I felt comfortable, protected somehow, in her presence. She never walked all the way to school with me, but her parting words were always the same. Remember, if you are a good boy here on earth, you can serve me in heaven. I was five years old. Her words sounded magical to me, vast and alluring. I didn't know her. I barely knew her name, but the offer she held out to me each morning seemed far too generous to dismiss lightly. In class, I would think about what servitude in heaven would be like. I imagined myself carrying buckets of water for her on streets of gold, rubbing her feet as angels sang praises in the background. I imagined that I'd have my own heavenly shack. I'd have time to do my own personal heavenly things as well. How else would I get to heaven? One day I told my father about her offer. We were talking about heaven, a favorite subject of his, and I mentioned that I already had a place there. I've already found someone to serve, I said. <laughs> what do you mean? Dad smiled warmly at me. I felt his love. I repeated myself, Daddy, I'm going to heaven. And how are you going to get there? I told him about the old lady, my heavenly shack, the streets of gold. My father stared at me a moment, grief and sadness surging briefly to the surface of his face, and then anger. He leaned forward, stared into my eyes. Listen to me now. The only person you will serve in heaven is God. You will serve no one else. My father has told me many times that he settled in Utah because he didn't want to be where anyone else was. His cousins and siblings had left Nigeria for Athens, London, Rome, New York City, and Houston. My father wanted to be an American, but he also craved isolation. So he decided he would travel to a city in America he knew nothing about. He left Nigeria in 1979 after a school in Utah, Weber State University, offered him a place in its mechanical engineering program. His bride, my mother, accompanied him. They arrived in a country that bore little resemblance to the country they expected. Dad, a devout fan of television shows like Gunsmoke and Bonanza, was disappointed when he discovered that cowboy hats were no longer in style, and he sadly stowed his first American purchase, a brown 10-gallon hat that he bought during a layover in Houston in his suitcase and under his bed. Mom arrived in America expecting peace and love. She had fallen for the music of the Beatles and the Beach Boys as a high school student in Lagos while listening to the records that her businessman father brought back from his trips abroad. Though she had imagined a country where love conquered all, where black people and white people lived together in peace and harmony, mom and dad arrived instead in a place where there were no other black people for miles around, a place dominated by a religion they never heard of before. But this was America, and they were in love. They moved into a small apartment in Ogden, Utah, and started a family. I came first in 1981, and my brother followed in 1983. Dad attended his classes during the day while Mom took care of us at home. Occasionally, she explored the city while pushing my brother and me along in a double stroller. Soon enough, we were all walking hand in hand. At night, my parents held each other close and spoke their dreams into existence. They would have more children. 
My father would start a business. They would become wealthy. They would send their children to the best schools. They would have many grandchildren. They would build their own version of paradise on a little slip of desert in a country that itself was a dream, a place that seemed impossible until they stepped off the plane, shielding the sun from their eyes and saw for themselves the expanse of land that my father had idly pointed to on a fading map many years before. As I look back now, especially with the knowledge of what will come after, the rest of my life set in unflattering relief, I realized that my first five years were the most ordinary of my childhood. We moved frequently, but I can only remember joy. One of my favorite memories from this era, for some reason I'm chasing my brother around our apartment with a red crayon. When I catch him, I pin him against the wall and color each of his teeth red as he screams. <laughs> my mother shrieks when she sees him. She thinks he's bleeding because of the red wax that's shining from his teeth. She laughs when I tell her that the blood isn't real, and then we all laugh, and I allow my brother to color my teeth as well. Then we color mom's teeth. She prefers lime green. Life flowed easily until we moved to Bountiful. We settled, we settled there because my father had found a job at an auto repair shop in neighboring Layton, and Bountiful was one of the few places close by with any affordable housing. My father couldn't find a job as a mechanical engineer anywhere in northern Utah, but he knew a bit about cars, and he figured he would work as a mechanic until something better came along. My mother's illness began to reveal itself to us shortly after we moved into our two-bedroom apartment, a tiny place near the center of town with pale yellow walls and bristly carpet. Mom's voice, once quiet and reassuring, grew loud and fearsome. Her hugs, once warm and comforting, became cold and rigid. She stopped cooking for us. Sometimes my brother and I didn't eat until my father returned from work in the evening. She began to spend more time in her room, away from us. One morning, my brother shook me awake and told me that dad was crying. I did not believe him. I didn't think such a thing was possible. We scrambled to the living room and saw mom standing over dad, her eyes boiling with rage. My father was naked. His clothes, now nothing more than torn rags, were arrayed haphazardly around the room. He was bleeding from a wound on his thigh and his face was wreathed in a constellation of sweat and tears. My brother and I reached over to him, but mom cursed at us. Get the hell out of here. I was terrified. I looked at dad. His bottom lip was shaking. His teeth were red. Yes, go, he said. What are you waiting for? Go now. We ran. We hugged each other in the corner of our room. Moments later, my father began to scream. Over the course of the next few days, my brother and I witnessed this scene many times. My father cowering on the floor, my mother standing imperiously over him. He took her punishment whenever she descended into one of her moods, and afterward he would enter our room with a calm smile and tell us mom wasn't feeling like herself, but that everything would soon be okay. We tried our best to believe him. Before long, we realized the truth. After dad left for work each morning, my mother locked herself in their room. She rarely interacted with us, but occasionally she opened the door and asked us to come inside. She asked us to stand in the corner of the room near the dresser. She pointed to various places in her room, her closet, dad's desk, the empty space near her full-length mirror. She asked us if we saw it. See what, mommy? Don't you see that? What is wrong with you? My brother and I glanced at each other. Was this a game? Mommy, I don't see anything. Can we go now? No. Not until you tell me what it is doing there. Tell me why it won't leave. Sometimes my brother and I lied. We made up stories about what we saw my mother nodded sagely. Sometimes she disagreed with us and told us to look again. This could have been fun, but the wild look in my mother's eyes unsettled us. Sometimes she told us that we had to leave before they came to get us. Something about this place isn't right, she'd say. Not right at all. Then she'd pull up her covers, switch on the radio, and mutter herself to sleep. I started school on September 7, 1987, a few weeks before I turned six. I was ecstatic because I'd spent much time watching the kids in my neighborhood trip past my bedroom window with books under their arms and bags in their backs, like they were departing for another world. I dimly sensed that at school I could become something more than a brother or son, that each day I went, I would come back carrying knowledge that was mine alone. My father walked with me to school that first day. I remember the principal extending her hand when I met her. I shyly extended mine as well. And as we shook hands, she said, we are very happy that you're here. It was in her eyes, the way she looked at me, like I was something scary and unknown. That's how I knew I was different. 
On the playground, all my classmates asked if they could touch my hair. I said, okay. Then Simon rubbed my skin and ran away crying to the playground attendant. It won't come off, he wailed. Why won't it come off? I was too tired after school to ask my father any questions, too excited about everything I just experienced. But the next day, after another kid rubbed my arm until it was raw, I asked my father why my hair was so kinky and why I couldn't wash the brown off my skin. He shook his head and frowned. He began talking about the importance of pride, the meaning of self-respect, but I didn't really understand what he was saying. As he spoke, I thought about the old lady I'd met a few hours before. That morning, Dad had hugged me at the door of our apartment and told me that I'd have to walk to school by myself because he had to work and Mom wasn't feeling well. I said okay, but I was afraid because school seemed so far away. As I walked to school, tentatively, nervously, she suddenly appeared like I dreamed her into existence. She told me her name was Mrs. Hansen and she asked me what I was doing. I told her I was walking to school. She smiled. I've never seen a little black boy around here before, she said. Where are you from? I'm from here, I said. She laughed and placed a hand on my shoulder. She spoke as we walked and I enjoyed hearing her voice, the gentle rise and fall of it because it somehow seemed familiar to me. She asked me questions about dad and mom and my brother. She told me that she'd always wanted to go to Africa, but she'd never had the chance. When we were about a block from school, she looked into my eyes and patted my head. I enjoyed speaking with you. You are a wonderful little boy. She blinked slowly and nodded. Keep it up. Maybe one day you'll get to serve me in heaven. If you do, I promise you'll get everything you've ever wanted. The happiness I felt as I turned and ran to school, the sheer joy, is something I've been searching for ever since. Thank you. So, it might be too early to ask for questions, but I'll do that anyway. Any questions or, hey. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hey. Tope, how much of this is autobiographical? Sure. Thank you. A lot of it is very autobiographical. You know, the one thing I discovered when I started writing, um, I, I mentioned before that I started writing in 2010, and I had no idea what I wanted to write, and so I figured I was working on a memoir. And so I just thought, well, I'll, I'll write a memoir. And um, I wrote a few chapters, and I very enthusiastically sent some chapters to agents and editors, and... Um, and they responded positively, and they said, um, we like what you've given us, but you should actually focus on the father figure in the book. If you, I had an agent actually tell me that if you focus on that character, um, well, I can guarantee a six-figure advance. I mean, this writing is compelling, but you need to do an immigration story. And so for a while, I considered doing that, and I had ample material. My parents are immigrants. I've been around immigrants my entire life. Um, so I seriously considered doing that. Um, but the moment I try to do that, like something kind of, and it might sound weird and mystical, but had some kind of force that say, no, that's not what you're supposed to be writing. And so I decided to write more about a character who resembles me. The thing I discovered while doing so, though, is that uh, I just couldn't pin myself down on the page as well as I wanted to. I just couldn't do it. Um, and in addition to that, whenever I wrote, because uh, in full honesty, it's my, it's my book launch, I'll be honest here. Um, the character initially had my name. Um, but then he was doing things that I would never do and thinking thoughts I never thought before. And so there began to be a kind of really uh, sort of profound divergence between my path and his path. And so um, that's when I figured, like, I'm writing a work of fiction, so I guess I'm along for the ride. Um, but that said, I, anyone who knows even a bit about my biography will kind of recognize certain touchstones in the life of Tunde. Um, but yeah, he's a figure who's apart from me. And there's a crucial, I, no spoilers, but there's a crucial point in the book where he makes that abundantly clear. So thank you for that question. I sense more questions. Paired with, with shyness or something. Okay, here we go. Hey. I have to give this, uh, she's very important to me as well. Um, so I, was, I went to this, um, this uh, right before I went to Morehouse, it was a kind of pre- um, sort of freshman program for high achieving African American high Free school college. seniors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was one of my uh, counselors there. And she was an incredible force in my life. And, and I learned so much from her. Fast forward nine years, and I'm in London for the Kane Prize. And who's sitting at my table? <laughs> 
but this wonderful human being. It's so good to see you. Thank you for coming out. I had to. I just remember when you mentioned the memoirs. You remember writing those memoirs, 11 o'clock at night? Yeah. Yeah. Imagine 17-year-old boys writing memoirs, 11 o'clock at night. That's what we made them do. <laughs> but I'm interested in your poetry connection because yeah. you started talking about it and you were in here and you're writing poems. Whose poems were you snitching? That's what we want to know. <laughs> and also, like, for yourself, do you write poetry? Are you one of these secret poetry writers as well? So where was that poetry connection that then led you into your fiction? And what, you know, and what kind of the, what the poems in here that were really motivating you? It's a very writerly question, I expect. <laughs> I think, thank you for that. Um, you know, what happened was that I was working at Google and I had it in my mind because, um, so I spent two years at Oxford and I had an incredible time. The reason I had such a great time was because it was the first time in my life where I could sort of hang out. I wasn't, I mean, I didn't have the pressure of studying for a quiz or test every two seconds. And so my mind kind of wandered and I started reading a lot of literature and, and going, I, I started doing things I'd never done before. I started going to museums. I started, um, you know, going to lectures and all kinds of things. And at the end of my tenure at Oxford, um, when I got my job at Google, I talked to my boss there and I said, well, you know, I'm interested because at that point, I'm not sure if Google is still saying this, but they said, you know, you could spend 20% of your time doing whatever it is you want to do, um, as long as it's some way connected to our mission. And I said, well, I want to be a writer. And they're like, okay, whatever, but okay, we'll give you some money for this. And so I had a 200 pound allowance every month to buy books, um, which was very generous of them. And I started writing and I just, I, you know, like many writers, I wrote this first novel that was just like just achingly bad just just horrible and you know I was reading it to myself one day and I said how do I get better and so I started I went back to the writers I admired people like I don't know Dennis Johnson for his one and others as well and um, I noticed that they had all they all wrote poetry as well and so I said well I it, for me it was initially a means to an end if I write if I read poetry I can become a better writer and I did that and then I just kind of fell deep down into the poetry hole to be honest and started writing my own poems. I won't be reading any tonight. Um, but started writing lots and lots of poems. And so by the time I arrive back here in the States, um, I'm convinced that I want to be a poet. And that's my path in life. And, um, and so in terms of who I was reading, I was reading Lucille Clifton, um, Kay Ryan. Um, let's see, um, so many people. Uh, Ted Kuzer was somebody else that I really liked. Jane Hirschfeld. Um, a guy named E. Ethelbert Miller was so, very important to me as well. Um, so, I mean, countless people come to mind. Um, but I was reading, um, I went back and I, you know, engaged with Langston and and his generation of, of um, and then the Black Power Poets and uh, the Black Arts Movement's Poets. I read everyone, to be honest. And I, you know, as I continue that process of, of like writing poetry, um, it came to me that um, that the things I was trying to say, I could maybe better say better in prose. And so that's why I kind of migrated back into prose. But poetry remains really important to me. Um, in terms of artists who changed my life, um, the one artist that I kind of read, I, I was so, you know, what, what I, I was reading a book by Ted Kuzer about how to write poetry. And in that book, um, there's a section from a poem by Tomas Tronstromer. And um, that changed my life. I remember when I was growing up, my dad, who was very religious, would often tell me that there will come a time when you're in church where, you know, you'll accept Jesus and then all your life will change and your fingertips will buzz and you'll have a halo around you. And I never had that experience, really. And I thought something was wrong with me. The first time I read Transtromer, that happened to me. Um, and it was a profoundly powerful experience for me. And so... Um, I read him and his sort of generation of poets for a very long time as well, and that's why the uh, epigraph of my book is from Transtromer. But um, I just figured out over time that that uh, prose was my pathway, and we'll see what happens with the poetry later on. But for now, it's prose. Hey, a colleague. Hi, Tope. Hey. Um, my book club is going to read your book oh, this thank fall, you. and thank I you. wonder what question or questions you might ask of readers. Um, to, to spark discussion? This is a dangerous question. Um, <laughs> um, well, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the book because, you know, there's this, I'm so glad I didn't know much about marketing or anything about around literature before this book came out because I kind of wrote the book and just thought it would figure itself out. And it's been really intriguing. I mean, I know some writers say don't, they don't read their reviews. I've read every single review like four times. <laughs> and it's really intriguing to kind of, you know, sort of, 
uh, see what folks are saying about the book and what's resonating. I, I become aware of the fact that there's a large part of the kind of literary um, world that is obsessed with kind of branding this as an immigrant novel or a coming of age novel. And those are two important components. I, I think it's less of an immigrant novel than some have argued, but I get why that's the case. When I was writing the book, I was really kind of concerned with two things. One is identity and identity construction, which is to say, how do I, how do I become who I am? Um, because that was something I struggled with mightily when I was growing up. I, my parents are from Nigeria. And so they said, they handed me a Nigerian card and said, this is who you are. And Go, go forth, young man. And I thought, like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm not a Nigerian, necess- like, like you are. And everyone around me said, okay, you're an American, you know, here you are. And I didn't quite know how to do that. And so I had a very difficult time for much of my childhood trying to construct a self that made sense. And much of this book is about um, the process of doing so in a country where you are marginalized. You know, my father, very much like Tunde's father, determined that if I had to be successful, that he had to kind of cr- condition me create this kind of super black man, somebody who was, you know, well-spoken and well-traveled and all these things. And so I remember when I was very young, he was giving me like elocution lessons and, and he was, you know, uh, every, like there was a handwriting competition at school and he's like, you have to win the handwriting competition. And so he had me writing A's for an hour and B's for an hour. And his sense was that if, because of what he had suffered and what he had been through, his sense was that if his children, um, just kind of presented themselves as acceptable to society, that everything would be fine. And I did that for much of my life. My entire objective was to be acceptable to other people. How can I present myself in a way that doesn't alienate people or push them away from me? How can I present myself in a way that doesn't scare people off? And to be perfectly frank, it wasn't until I really, I got to Oxford where I began to push that narrative away from me. So a long way of saying that one of the themes I think that your book club should engage with is identity construction. And the second is my obsession with the way that we can construct reality. And the reason why I'm particularly kind of concerned with this is because, and this is related to my first point, when I was growing up, I mentioned before that my father was very religious. And I just remember um, our conversations about religion, going to a church with you know, um, white, long-haired, hippie Jesus looking down on me, like, as if I had done something wrong and feeling very kind of sensitive to that. Um, and my father also sort of telling me um, that he was happy. And and this is, I'm, you know, breaking news. Is I'm thinking about this for my second novel. Um, how he was convinced that, like, colonialism was okay because the end product, which was Christianity coming to Africa, was 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 good. And so he was very proud of being a Christian. And if the means to that was, you know, sort of dozens of years of horrificness, then the end point was acceptable. And I remember having, like, heated debates with my father about this. And so I began to think about the way that our reality is constructed. And I grew up in a reality that said, in order to be acceptable as a black person, you have to be a particular kind of black man, right? So um, you have to be somebody who is, again, presentable and and everything else. And so I, I, it wasn't until I was a bit older that I began to kind of see that reality hinges, the reality that we accept hinges on certain points. You know, we're, even now we're sitting on land that was stolen. I don't mean to get too political, but that's true, right? Like, and we don't have conversations about um, who inhabited this land and how this land was taken from them. So our entire reality is about kind of ignoring this. And even going to the grocery store, I go in and buy, you know, very neatly packaged, beautiful products, and I don't think about who might make them. The reason why this might resonate with me more is that I know that perhaps I have a cousin or an uncle or a niece who's making these products somewhere and is suffering in so doing. I've had the tremendous privilege of growing up in this country, being born and raised in this country, and um, having an opportunity to, you know, sit, stand before you and talk about my work of fiction. But I, I always remember the fact that there are so many who have just as much talent and drive and potential and who are suffering immensely. And so um, I think kind of the, the way that we construct reality and how that constructed reality influences our decisions is another thing I would encourage your book club to talk about. Thank you for the question. Well, thank you for uh, a great reading, and also thank you for bringing another great poet here, uh, <laughs> Ethelbert Miller. <laughs> yes, very happy to see you. Um, I just wanted to find out how your uh, HBCU, your historically black uh, uh, education, shaped your thinking and your writing. Yeah, um, so I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, and... Um, Morehouse to me when I was growing up was um, just a really important space. My father used to make me watch, again, I 
my father was a very important presence in my life. There was a, a documentary that, not a, doc, a movie that appeared on PBS about Booker T. Washington. Um, and it was basically about how he became Booker T. Washington. Um, it starred a young LeVar Burton was in it and um, a very young child actor whose name I can't remember right now. Um, but it's basically about, you know, he kind of is born in slavery. He just wants to read. He can't read. It's illegal. Um, and then emancipation happens. And, um, and he still can't read because he goes off with his stepfather to work the salt mines. Uh, and finally, he kind of, somebody takes, you know, mercy on him and he starts to read. And my father, I, now, I watch this movie at least once or twice a week. Um, uh, and so, and then I became curious about Booker T. Washington and I discovered that he founded the Tuskegee Institute. And so for a, wh a while, I wanted to go to Tuskegee. And then, um, kind of in my desperation to soak up, soak up as much black culture as I could, I started watching A Different World, <laughs> which was uh, produced by a man we will not name here at this point. But um, uh, A Different World uh, takes place at this school called Hillman, which is kind of an amalgamation of Morehouse and Spellman. And so I became obsessed. I was like, wow, these are very like beautiful, attractive, smart people. And I want to be in that space. And so I figured that if I went to Morehouse, I would kind of find my people finally. And so I eagerly applied to Morehouse. Um, and the thing I discovered, I know I have some Morehouse brothers in the audience, so I'm not trying to, you know. But the thing I discovered when I was there was that um, that I still had I still had a bit of road in terms of my identity journey to travel because um, there were a number of people who came from sort of upper middle class, upper class backgrounds who had a different, completely different kind of experience as Americans and black Americans than I'd had. And I didn't know anything about this world. And so it was somewhat difficult for me initially to kind of understand that, which is one of the reasons that I spent my sophomore year at uh, Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, where I met Stephanie. Um, and then I went to South Africa for a bit, then I came back. But um, I think my Morehouse experience becomes very, very important kind of 10 years after I graduate because you know, I recognize um, how important it was for me to be in that space with other. The one thing I tell people when they ask me about Morehouse, and I have the privilege now of like um, talking to folks who are thinking about going to Morehouse, is uh, I have never been in a class with smarter people than I was in my honors college program at Morehouse College. Uh, they were some of the brightest, most driven people I've ever met. All of them are doing fantastic things right now. And for me, that was incredibly powerful because when I was growing up, I was always a bit of the outsider because I was the nerdy black people, but you know, black person, but at Morehouse, I was multiplied by 500 in my class and I wasn't that special anymore. So I had to find new ways to differentiate myself. And so uh, I'm very, very happy that I went to Morehouse and it's a crucial part of my biography. Thank you for the question. Hey, Zoe, Hi. another wonderful friend. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I would love to hear a little bit from you about what uh, winning the Kane Prize meant in terms of your journey with identity and yeah. whether it was, you know, that was sort of like the moment of validation and it was all downhill from there or whether <laughs> it had additional challenges. Sure. Um, Kane Prize was uh, very important to me, actually. I So... I had published one story um, when a friend, another mentor, a guy named Helon Habila, who couldn't be here today, but um, he was somebody that I was, you know, I I was, uh, I knew Helon lived in town and that he taught at, um, uh, where does he teach? Uh, Mason, George Mason, exactly. Thank you. Um, he taught at George Mason. And so I like actually took the train over there and I took a car and I showed up in one of his classes and I said, hey, I'm trying to be a writer. And he kind of was like, what's wrong with you? And, um, and he said, come back next week at Thursday or something. And so I did that. And to his credit, you know, I went into his office and we had a good talk about fiction. And I, you know, at that point in my life, I was always carrying my stories with me. And so I had a story on me and I said, hey, I, what I just read actually, I said, hey, would you mind reading this? And he's like, what? You know, like, what's wrong with this guy? Um, and then he called me like 30 minutes later. He says, I think this is a very strong story. Um, do you have anything else? And I so showed him some other stories. And, um, and around that time, I sent a story called Miracle into a journal called Transition, which is uh, published by Harvard University. Uh, and and it, was, it was published. And I sent it to Helon, and Helon got back to me and said, you have to submit this for the Kane Prize. Now, this was interesting because I knew about the Kane Prize, of course, but I wasn't sure I was eligible. I was born and raised in America. And Helan said, no, if you have at least one parent who was born and raised in Africa, then you, you're fine, you qualify. I had two, and so I thought, okay. Um, I didn't think I had a chance, but I was like, why not you know, 
throw my hat in the ring. And so um, I was shortlisted. And wow, that was an incredible experience because it was, you know, validating because this was the first, my first published story. And I was having, I was being flown to London and, you know, going to the House of Lords and doing all these crazy, wonderful things, you know, also problematic things for my, you know, sort of historical vantage point, but, you know, really interesting things. And um, at the same time, there were all these questions, you know, I remember somebody actually, um, you know, somebody was, you know, tweeting or, you know, saying something on Facebook about how I shouldn't sort of qualify for the Kane Prize because I was born and I benefited from all this privilege and I, sh I was taking someone else's slot. And I, you know, thought deeply about that, but I thought I, I won't have to deal with this because, you know, people like Chanel Okparanta, who's here, is a wonderful writer. She'll likely win, so it's all good. And I was fortunate enough to win. And I'll never forget, like, um, I was in uh, Oxford, and the thing that happens when you win the Kane Prize is that there's, like, a table of, like, press, and you walk up, you give your, your spiel, and then the moment you walk out, you know, walk away from the podium, like, somebody sticks a microphone in your face, and, of course, the first question is, are you actually an African? Um, and I was like, wow, that's a really, you know, I guess I'll have to deal with this. Um, so, yeah, you know, like... It, I was prepared for that because I've spent my entire life kind of grappling with the question of who I actually am. And um, I think I am now, if you ask me, I would say I'm Nigerian and American. Um, and I, I think that and between the two is very important because it's a space where all kinds of interesting, interesting things can happen. So, um, but at the time, I, I certainly felt sensitive about it. And I thought like, okay, well, this will make it hard to market the novel because, you know, they'll say, what's this, you know, this uh, African doing writing about American stuff? And so, and I've even seen some of that reflected in some of the coverage about the book about, you know, like some people say this is an African novel. Some people say it's an American novel. Um, but that doesn't concern me as much anymore. And I think it's primarily because I went through that sort of really arduous and interesting experience of winning the Kane Prize. So thank you for the question. We do have time for a few more questions if anybody is... Reading and willing? Don't be shy. Hey. Um, you talk a lot about your father. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious whether your own experience of the father has changed your view of identity, if as you're dealing with your daughter, if, you know, her identity and your identity and how that's yeah. maybe changing her perspective. Gosh, that's a great question and it has profoundly, you know. Um, I have a daughter and she's two now and I just changed her diaper like an hour and a half ago. So, you know, <laughs> I'm still fully in, in fatherhood mode. <laughs> fatherhood mode. Um, you know, the thing that about like her and about raising her is that I think more deeply about um, the things that I kind of just took on when I was younger. So, you know, for example, I'm very aware of the fact that she's learning what beautiful is right now. And I wonder how that relates to her, you know, if she sees herself in depictions, depictions of beauty. And, um, and I'm very sensitive to that. Or, um, I, or the way that her, you know, her teachers at daycare talk about her and talk with her about who she is and, and, and who she aspires to be. Because the honest truth is that I was severely damaged by that experience growing up. You know, I remember there, was, uh, there were moments in my life when I was so ashamed of myself that I kind of avoided the mirror. I remember avoiding the mirror for like five years of my life. I was just ashamed of my presence in this country, of the way I looked, of my very kind of being. And, um, and so that's one of the reasons why I became like really obsessed with like studying because studying and becoming, you know, intelligent for me was like the way to kind of put, keep that at arm's length. And so I think in some ways that stunted my development and growth. And so, of course, I'm really sensitive about, like, what she's taking in. And in some ways, this relates to, as well to, um, you know, kind of my obsession with this reality that we inhabit and, and that we, this kind of constructed re reality that we think is just reality, but is actually constructed. It was constructed by a group of people, you know, many years back to benefit one group of people. I think about that all the time. Um, my wife is a principal at a school in Southeast called the Bishop Walker School for Boys. And she came back home one day and said that her kids were obsessed with the film Black Panther and that they were watching it all the time. And that really resonated with me because I think one of the reasons why they are is because, you know, they see an image of themselves being powerful and intelligent and wise. And I didn't have access to those kinds of images when I was growing up. And if that kind of film had existed when I was young, that would have been a solve. That would have been um, something that really empowered me in very important ways. And so 
I think the heartening thing about sort of living at this moment in 21st century is that there are, you know, any number of creatives who are thinking about that audience and, and, um, and talking with that audience and interacting with that audience. And I think my benefit, my daughter will benefit directly from that. But I think too, that I have to be more conscientious in a way that my parents weren't capable of just because they were immigrants who were trying to make, and they had economic concerns and all kinds of things. Like I'm sensitive to the ways that I was damaged by my sort of growing up in this country and I will mess up in some other way that, and she can write a book about it and implicate me as well. So. <laughs> Hey, Chopin. Hey, hey. I think maybe my question, if I can figure out how to frame it, it maybe picks up from what you're talking about, which is essentially being a black person in our white supremacist country, our sort of toxically, viciously white supremacist country. So I don't know. You are, you came, you're the child of immigrants, so you didn't come up through generations here in terms of dealing with that sure. danger. And I don't know if you feel that some of the, what you um, look at in your book is about dealing with white supremacy, if it is relevant to black people who have lived here for generations. So anyway, I don't know if I've got a very <laughs> clear question. Yeah, but. I think it's relevant to, um, you know, I am... I, I think I spoke before a little bit about my my parents growing up in a colonial situation in Nigeria and how that impacted them. You know, my dad would often tell me when he, when I was growing up with pride as well that one of the reasons why uh, my family was successful in Nigeria was that my grandfather um, was doing really well in a colonial school and the uh, teachers said, oh, this is a bright guy, let's like give him, you know. And so my, for my father it was a point of pride and for me for many years it was a point of pride like, yeah, I come from smart stock, that's incredible. Um, but then later on, I thought like, but they were sort of taking him out to inculcate within him um, the kind of uh, idea that the system that he inhabited was okay because he was at the helm, or at least in terms of black people in Nigeria, he was at the helm. And so that said to him, okay, well, if you're in that situation, a part of you might want to keep the system intact because you are at the helm, right? And many, many countries have experienced this, obviously. So... Yeah, it's something I've dealt with, and I, I think the book kind of takes that on specifically with respect to religion, which is something that uh, is a is a through line in my family's life, something that's very important to my father, and um, something that's important to me, but in, dif in a different way. Um, I am, you know, I spent a lot of time to, I had a wonderful teacher when I was in fourth grade. Her name was Mrs. Nichols. She was my music teacher. And um, she used to, I, and I had this experience a couple of times in Utah where a teacher would pull me aside and tell me something. And she, I, I, I loved singing back then. I was in like three choirs and she said, you know what, we're going to start um, singing uh, spirituals in this uh, uh, Negro spirituals um, for the next few months. And I know that she did this explicitly for me because I was there because I was the only person of color in that, in that choir. And after a couple of times of singing, one day she pulled me aside and said, you know, she talked about the double messages um, that were within Negro spirituals, that one, it was meant to be a kind of affecting melody um, and that the, the master wouldn't necessarily understand what was happening, but that um, the person who was singing it was signaling to other people that, um, that something, you know, that freedom is nigh. You know, if you go out during the night, you, you have a network of people who will sponsor and protect you as you try to make a way to freedom. And so the idea of double messages kind of really, really kind of resonated with me. And that's something that is um, really important in this book as well. I've tried to embed a number of double messages that no reviewer has picked up yet. But um, <laughs> but for me, it's a really kind of important thread of the book. I mean, I also love music. And, you know, I, if I stand in front of a room of certain peop of people and I say, you know, I woke up, uh, got out of bed, I dragged a comb across my head, they'll instantly know what I'm talking about, right? The last track of the um, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band, or if I said the Mississippi Delta is shining like a national guitar, people instantly understand what I'm saying. For me, a, a line that's like that is, uh, now the joy of my world is in Zion because I was obsessed with the miseducation of Lauryn Hill when I was growing up. And so that line, um, don't tell my publisher because we haven't paid any royalties, but that appears in my book. <laughs> and it appears in my book for a very specific reason because of that lesson that Miss Nichols taught me when I was in the fourth grade a few years back. So, yeah.
Hi. Hey, how you Congratulations. Doing? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think, if I remember correctly, that while we were in London... Oh, you're going to tell... Hey, hey. No. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> No. No, a simple question. Sure. We were asked lots of political questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are in politics and prose. Yes. And you have talked about music and yeah. beauty. Yeah. And I remember, we. I think we had a conversation where I thought, um, I just want to write something beautiful. I don't Why all these political questions i'm so tired of the yeah politics. yeah i remember that and we we talked about just writing something beautiful so i'm wondering and of course now i think that everything is political and i'm sure you think the same thing absolutely too. yeah but i'm wondering what awareness you went into writing this novel like how did you think about balancing the politics with the beauty um or did you just write it and not worry about that yeah you know, how much did it matter what yeah it's such audience. a great question thank you um um, I think, yeah, I'm like you. And I, I remember, I think I remember the conversation. Please check me if I'm wrong here. But I too went through a period where I was obsessed with aesthetics and beauty. And that was what I was concerned with. And even in kind of writing, my obsession was to ensure that the cl sentences were as clean as possible, that the paragraphs were beautiful. But to your point, um, I don't think it's possible to write, especially if I'm writing about a life that resembles mine, to write without invoking or at least sort of referencing politics and how we're all deeply affected by um, forces beyond our control. Um, we're all, I mean, everything that's written is political. And that's part of the point I'm trying to make um, with respect to uh, our reality, that everything is political. I mean, we're kind of born in the system that says, you know, these people do this, th those people do that. Um, and if you're like me or if you're an immigrant, you know, if you're like me when I was young or an immigrant, you kind of don't question that. You think, I just want to be successful. These are the rules of the game. I will play by these rules. You start playing by those rules and you discover that the rules don't really benefit you. The rules are meant to ensure that maybe one or at, lo at most two or three people make it to the very top and extol the virtues of the system while you are still kind of trotting underneath someone's foot. And so uh, I think once I became aware of that, I became aware of the fact that the reason why it was important, and I can't help but reference Toni Morrison again, to write you know, my own story, or at least a version of it, was because um, if I don't kind of surface the things I experienced growing up um, and surface the kinds of things that someone like Tunde will ex experience as growing up, that there will continue to be a narrative about how this system is acceptable. Um, I think something radical needs to happen. I really, really do in order to kind of upend the current system. And obviously we're having a national political conversation about it. And I think it's a very important conversation, but I sometimes don't think we're having, the conversation is going deep enough. Um, in order to prevent, you know, people like me growing up as broken as I did, um, something has to change. And that relates, Karen, to the story, the question you asked before about my daughter. I think about this obsessively. Like how can I ensure that she has, her, her spirit is intact throughout her childhood? I stay up at night thinking about that, especially in the system, which, you know, let's be honest, isn't very concerned with that. So, yeah, I can't help but write, you know, in a very political way, um, even if that's not the kind of point. I'm writing a novel. It has to be a good yarn. I want you to keep turning the pages. Um, I want you to come back and buy more. But, um, but yeah, I, you know, I can't help but obsess about ensuring that um, the work that I put out into the world is honest and genuine and true, that it's about a particular experience and not about the experience it's meant to be to placate those in power. So we're gonna call this the, the final question. We do have to move on to the book signing, but the final question of the evening. Mr. Harris, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I was going to hopefully have lunch with you and maybe ask this question over lunch, but I'll, okay. figure, this I'll is, ask it now. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you wrote in the book, uh, and it was powerful. You say, I enjoyed speaking with you. You were a wonderful little boy. She blinked slowly and nodded. Keep it up. Maybe one day you'll get to serve me in heaven. If you do, I promise you'll get everything you've ever wanted. That sounds condescending. Yeah. That sounds as if it's a white person talking to a black person in a servitude type of situation. Yeah. You're the least angry person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> what, 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 what does this mean? I mean, what, what is this particular reference? There, yeah. There must be a couple of layers to it. Yeah, thank you for pulling that out. Um, so the, the scene to me means two things. It means from her perspective, she's giving him a gift. She's like, I think you're special. I think you're a wonderful little boy. And 
in terms of my conception of the world, um, because of your skin color and who you come from, the highest level you can hope to reach is to kind of serve me in heaven. And so she gives him that gift from her perspective. It's something lovely and wonderful. From his perspective, he's somebody who is desperate for love. His mother is, um, you know, having struggles and isn't exhibiting the love that he needs. And so the fact that there's this woman who approaches him and says this to him means the world to him. But it also means that he is beginning to accept the idea that um, oppression and that being, again, ser um, serving somebody is something that he should aspire to, that that should be the focus and goal of his life. Um, his mother gives him a very important gift at the end of that chapter. I don't want to spoil it, but um, even though she's kind of spiraling downward, she gives him something important to help him later on escape from that cycle. But the reason why I wrote that scene is because I wanted to like write a scene that captured in a very kind of pithy way what I experienced growing up and what I wanted when I was growing up. I wanted people to like me. I wanted, you know, um, I wanted white love, to be perfectly honest. And I did receive it. Um, from people, I had a teacher in first grade who would often take me to the museum, um, and she loved me, I think, without some of the baggage that I'm describing in this scene. But there were others who, whose love was predicated on me becoming like them. And I think especially in a conservative space like Utah, this is what happens. I mean, you're an outsider, and so people say, okay, in order for you to become the black friend, you know, like, go to my church, um, you know, watch the things that I watch, talk the way that I talk and you'll, you'll be acceptable. And so I pined for that desperately growing up. And it took a lot of like reading and other things for me to kind of depart from that framework. And so I wanted to write about how that happens in the beginning. The way it happens is that you just want love and affection and attention. And if you're in a very vulnerable place and somebody offers that to you, you don't care that it's larded with condescension and a problematic viewpoint. You just want the love, you'll take it, you'll take it if it's studded with other things that'll end up hurting you immensely later on. And so that's why that scene was very important to me and thank you so much for pointing it out. How about one more round of applause?